July 26, 1944, a lone aircraft streaked across the sky high above Germany. Royal Air Force pilot Flight Lieutenant Albert Wall guided his de Havilland Mosquito on a long-range photo reconnaissance mission. Stripped down and carrying no weapons to reduce weight and improve speed, the plane flew at about 30,000 feet at more than 400 miles per hour. Few aircraft could keep up with it. As Lieutenant Wall began his return trip to base in Italy, he noticed an enemy aircraft approaching quickly from the rear. He was puzzled because the plane had no propellers and left two trails of exhaust behind it. Wall pushed the throttles of his de Havilland Mosquito all the way forward and began evasive action. For the next 15 minutes, the Royal Air Force crew played a dangerous game of cat and mouse with the much faster mystery aircraft, which made three attack passes as it zoomed by. Each time, Wall deftly maneuvered his plane to avoid being hit by four 30mm cannons. Despite that the two Royal Air Force pilots didn't know what hit them, they had just encountered the latest weapon advancement of Nazi Germany, the ME-262 Schwalbe, the first operational jet fighter in history. It was the height of World War II. The Nazi regime was desperately seeking ways to turn the tide of the war in their favor. The concept of what would become the turbojet engine was generally believed to be a key to air superiority. And the Germans knew this, so they turned to an idea they conceived in 1936. Several years before World War II, the Heinkel HE-178 took off into history as the first plane to be powered by jet engines. The Germans foresaw the great potential for the aircraft, and the RLM, the German Aviation Ministry, launched a competition for aviation companies to design the next generation fighter aircraft. The requirements were high. It must surpass any other aircraft in speed and maneuverability. It must outrun and outgun any opposing aircraft, be capable of one hour's endurance and have a speed of at least 530 miles per hour. Messerschmitt, a leading aircraft manufacturer in Germany at the time, submitted a design for the ME-262. Their design was revolutionary for its time, featuring twin jet engines mounted under the wings, providing the aircraft with the power to reach unprecedented speeds. The progression of the design was greatly delayed by technical issues involving the new jet engine. Many high-ranking officials believed the war could easily be won with conventional aircraft, so they were reluctant to release enough funding for the jet engine program. In mid-1943, Adolf Hitler envisioned the ME-262 as an offensive ground attack and bomber, rather than the defensive interceptor it was intended for. The configuration of a high-speed, light-payload fast bomber was intended to penetrate enemy airspace during the expected Allied invasion of France. He rejected arguments that the aircraft would be more effective as a fighter against the Allied bombers that were destroying large parts of Germany and wanted it as a bomber for revenge attacks. Hitler felt its superior speed compared to other fighters of the era meant it could not be attacked, and so he preferred it for high-altitude straight flying. The extent to which Hitler interfered with the development is unclear. It's debatable if his interference extended the delay in bringing the Schwalbe into operation, but his inputs resulted in the development of the Sturmvogel variant. The ME-262 design team spent countless hours perfecting the aircraft's engineering, making several trade-offs to ensure its speed and maneuverability. They opted for a simple and sleek design without adding extra weight to the aircraft. They found a smart way to reduce drag on the aircraft, which would otherwise hinder its performance. To this end, they made the fuselage very thin and used revolutionary swept-back wings at a time when most planes had straight wings, which not only helped with speed but also aided in stability. Messerschmitt initially sought to use turbojet engines in his design, but their reliability was questionable. The team eventually settled on the Junkers Jumo 004B engines, but these two suffered from numerous engine fires which set the project back considerably. To address the engine problems, the ME-262's design team introduced new cooling systems to prevent the engines from overheating and improved the fuel delivery systems to ensure that the engines received a consistent fuel supply. Their tireless efforts resulted to an engine with an operational lifetime of 50 flight hours, even with adequate maintenance. Operationally, carrying 583 gallons of fuel in total, the ME-262 would have a total flight endurance of 90 minutes. Consumption was double the rate experienced by typical twin-engine fighter aircraft of the era. As such, this led to the installation of a low fuel warning indicator in the cockpit to notify pilots when the remaining fuel fell below 66 gallons. 1944 
the ME262 finally entered production, and lots of problems emerged. The ME262 was a complicated machine to build, with many of its components requiring skilled labor and precision engineering. This made it challenging to produce the aircraft on a large scale. The Nazi regime was also struggling to keep the war effort going. Resources were scarce, and there were a lack of trained personnel to oversee the production of the aircraft. Many skilled workers who were crucial to the ME262's production had been drafted into the military, leaving the aircraft production line severely understaffed. The ME262 faced a shortage of critical resources like aviation fuel and runway infrastructure. This meant that pilots could not always fly the aircraft as intended. The ME262 was designed as a fighter, but was often used in a ground attack role, where its speed and maneuverability were of little use. The aircraft's significant weaknesses were exploited by Allied pilots who learned to counter its capabilities. March 18, 1945 a group of ME-262s attacked a fleet of American bombers and escorting fighters. The encounter was described by James Stewart, an American bomber pilot, who was flying his B-24 Liberator over Berlin. Stewart recalled, We were cruising along at 20,000 feet when I saw these nine jets come in at 11 o'clock high. They were coming in hot right into the middle of the formation, and I said to myself, Here's trouble. The ME-262s immediately attacked the B-24 formation, and a fierce dogfight ensued. Stewart's gunners managed to shoot down three of the ME-262s, but the remaining eight relentlessly pursued the bombers, firing their deadly cannons. Stewart recounted, We did everything we could do to get away from those things, but they were faster than anything we had, and their cannon shells went right through our airplane. The M262 shot down 12 bombers and one fighter, resulting in the loss of three ME262s. Although a 4 to 1 ratio was exactly what the Luftwaffe would have needed to make an impact on the war, the absolute scale of their success was minor, as it represented only 1% of the attacking force. The encounter highlighted the weaknesses of the ME262. The aircraft's high speed was limited by its short operational time due to its high fuel consumption. The ME-262s were forced to disengage after only a few minutes of combat, allowing the remaining B-24s to escape. Despite its deficiencies, the ME-262 clearly signaled the beginning of the end of piston-engined aircraft as effective fighting machines. Once airborne, it could accelerate to speeds over 530 miles per hour, about 100 miles per hour faster than the era's premier fighter, the P-51 Mustang. The ME-262 was so fast that German pilots needed new tactics to attack American bombers. In the head-on attack, the closing speed of about 320 meters per second was too high for accurate shooting. Even from the rear, the closing speed was too great to use the short-range 30 mm cannon to maximum effect. Allied bomber gunners found their electric gun turrets had problems tracking the jets. Target acquisition was difficult because the jets closed into firing range quickly and remained in firing position only briefly using their standard attack profile, which proved more effective. Encounters with the ME-262s were a significant milestone in aviation history, demonstrating the strong capabilities and weaknesses of jet-powered aircraft in combat. The ME-262's speed and armament made it a formidable opponent, and Allied pilots learned to respect the aircraft's capabilities. But it was far from invincible, and over time, Allied pilots learned to exploit its significant weaknesses. The ME-262 would ultimately be deemed a failure in the annals of German aviation history. Its impact on the war's outcome was minimal, and its production was too little, too late. The ME-262 Schwalbe was a remarkable aircraft that represented the peak of German aviation technology during World War II. Despite its ultimate failure in the war effort, the ME-262 left an indelible mark on aviation history. It inspired future generations of aircraft designers and engineers to push the boundaries of what was possible. The ME-262's sleek and futuristic design, with its twin jet engines mounted on its wings, inspired the development of supersonic commercial aircraft and advanced military jet aircraft. Its speed and maneuverability represented a turning point in military aviation, and demonstrated the potential for jet-powered fighters to outmaneuver and outperform traditional propeller-driven aircraft. Many design elements and technological innovations pioneered by the ME-262 are still present in modern military aircraft. The ME-262's failure is a cautionary tale for future aircraft development, highlighting the importance of careful planning, thorough testing, and a realistic assessment of the challenges ahead. The challenges that the Schwalbe faced in development, deployment, and combat 
demonstrated the importance of a comprehensive approach to aircraft design that takes into account factors such as logistics, maintenance and reliability. Despite the obstacles faced, the ME262 Schwalbe remains a testament to the power of innovation and ambition. Its legacy lives on, inspiring designers and engineers to continue pushing the boundaries of what is possible in the world of aviation. Its impact on the future of aviation is immeasurable, and its influence can still be felt in the aircraft we fly today.